we have tonight comes from Matthias on MongoDB and MongoDB mm. TV, Node.js. So he's going to talk a little bit about what's going on in Asia, I hope. Yeah. Nice. This journey with Tanya. And our regular Tristan will be talking about Dr. Al Tristan and I were supposed to be doing a joint presentation tonight, but I didn't have time to do my homework, so he graciously <laughs> volunteered to uh, take over the whole presentation for me. Um, some interesting stuff. So before I hand over the mic to anyone, is there any first timers here? Is this the first first one? First? Anyone not using MongoDB yet? Used to. Oh dear, okay. So I have to continue talking for a little while. Could have been uh, mostly just pretty pictures, so it reminds me a lot to say. I'd like to start off with this. So <laughs> these are three big clients in my opinion. Uh MTD. They're using the proprietary TMS, I believe that Foursquare is the biggest one that they're using for geolocation, but Disney has tens of thousands of servers, I believe, in one of their online games. So, how I got into MongoDB was for geolocation, and because Foursquare is in it. And the company I was with several years ago, we were building something similar to Foursquare in some ways, we needed to do proximity searches. And out of all the NoSQL solutions that were available at that time, MongoDB was the only one with geo support. It also has replica sets and sharding built in from day one, which is very good, obviously. <laughs> um, and it's bloody fast. Um, that, 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 that weekend when we first did our benchmarks for the Poly Conference, it was on 9 million records spread over the world, and we needed to find rank by proximity. The, the benchmark we did there showed that Mongo was 6,000 times faster than my sequel for doing that particular query. And it was from that day onwards that I never used my SQL again. <coughs> and it's what I like quite a lot, that it's, it doesn't get as much much mention as it should do, and this is something that Matthew is going to talk about in more detail, so I won't cover it too much. But they have a thing called GridFS, and it essentially allows you to store and serve media directly from the database, which prevents a lot of bottlenecks. And there's no language barriers. By that I mean, I mean, Tim MongoDB are officially supporting up to 60, how many? 12. 12 at the moment, and there's a bunch more of uh, community supported languages. But basically, most operating systems, most code languages, they're all covered. And they all work in the same way. The drivers are very, very familiar. So then, if we put this back into this kind of scheme of things, and we look at some charts, obviously going up, we have how fast it is, going to the right, we have how many features it has. This could be a traditional R collection network, such as on the CD. Then we have people that say, well, you should be using memcache or key value stores because they're incredibly fast. The problem is they have a very limited feature set. When you look at where MongoDB is, in the middle of things, I think that's a really nice sweet spot for me. And this, I guess, is why I use MongoDB for most projects, because it just suits my needs. And last but not least, my favorite picture is there's no spoon. And by that I mean there's no schemas. There's no uh, PHP my admin. I remember in the old days with MySQL, the first thing you start a new project, the first thing you have to do is you have to go and log into PHP my admin. You have to create a new database. You have to create some tables. You go back to your code and set some schemas and you go back to the. It was a nightmare. It didn't make sense. With, with MongoDB, none of that happens. You just build the application in your code. If you're in your code, you're saying, I want to send some data to this collection, this table, and that, that, that collection doesn't exist, MongoDB will create it for you. You don't need to say, you don't need to prepare the form. And that's what I mean by this most food. So as soon as you use MongoDB, I haven't needed to go and log into anything else to do anything. I just build my application and the data structure kind of evolves around my application. So, and that's why I have MongoDB. I let the professionals talk about it. <laughs> Uh, the idea is uh, I'm based in Singapore, 
so the idea is try to start uh, organize some events in this area, especially in Southeast Asia. We are talking about Malaysia, we are talking about Singapore, we are talking about Thailand. So the idea is that probably we are going to have these kind of events more often. Uh, so let's see. Okay, so uh, I started to work for uh, the old days now in Bolivia by the end of August. Usually when you start working for them, you are going to attend a couple of trainings in, in New York office where they are basically developed the, the main server. Uh, and they probably are going to uh, be assigned to one bootcamp project. The idea is you are going to be working one week with other engineers and basically you are going to create something using MongoDB and, and it's totally up to you what you want to work on. So I did my bootcamp in, in London and, and by those days we had some papers uh, about VFS. Uh, it seems that VFS sometimes is like the uh, always forgot feature, maybe as Mark said, you know, it's, it's not probably one of the top killer features. So I would say, well, I, I would like to work with VFS at least to have excuse to work with really. Uh, also, there are another functionality, it's called full text search. It's something that is, the current version is not enabled by default, you have to force it when you start the database. And it's something that I wanted to, to test as well. So, so basically, this is my bootcamp project. It's a one week project. Uh, you can check the, the source code in my GitHub repo here. You can see the URL. Uh, of course, it's not the best source so you can find out there, but it's, it's just an idea about how can be used. Okay, so basically, who am I? Uh, I'm originally from Buenos Aires, Argentina. Uh, in the last years, I moved several times, uh, mostly for personal slash professional reasons. Uh, basically, my wife is Spanish, so I moved to Spain to stay with her. So we have been living in Barcelona and Madrid. Uh, then we took Saudi time in, in, in Menorca, where it's a, it's a really nice place in Spain. I also work in the Netherlands for uh, a social network there, and, and now I'm based in Singapore. Uh, my background, uh, I study computer science. So in, in, in Buenos Aires, it's a six years career. And then my work experience always was on, on software development. I like to write code. Uh, I like to work on technical stuff. Uh, I don't want to, to be just drawing PowerPoints or some, something similar. I really like to, to write code. So this is one of the things I, I put emphasis when I started the interview with, uh, with MongoDB, but that time it was NG. Because maybe for, uh, for, for, for this role, they were looking for somebody also with the client-facing uh, skills. But one of my main concerns was, please don't put me away from the source code. At least, I don't know, once every two or three weeks I want to work with code. Uh, in my two books, you can find, in the old days I used to be the typical Java guy. So, I used to work with, in the old days, with strats and <laughs> newer technologies. Uh, then I switched a bit to Python, PHP, and uh, in the last day, JavaScript. But, I'm talking JavaScript on server side. I'm not good at front end stuff, so sorry about that. Uh, right now, as I said, I'm based in Singapore. So let's see what is FreeFS. FreeFS is just a specification. There is nothing else than that. It's just a convention about how are we going to use MongoDB documents. By the way, who knows what is MongoDB documents? Everybody's on the same page, yeah? Are we sure? Basically, we saw the information in MongoDB using documents. That is a kind of JavaScript object. So the idea, the idea was, okay, how 
can we do to survive using that structure? Hello? Uh, so basically it's just that. A specification that is implemented by us, our drivers. And also we provide a command line if you want to uh, access to those files from command line. Nothing new. It's exactly the same. The only thing that we needed to add to, 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 to have with basic, basically uh, we are using JSON, but internally we are using Python. Python is uh, acronym for a binary JavaScript object notation. The idea. Hello. So the idea of Python is uh, JavaScript that is a story binary format and also extended with new types that are not found in, in JavaScript by default. For example, we added a take object, we added object ID object. One of the fields type that we added is binary. And the, and the reason why we added binary to Python specification was especially to implement greedy face. So when you want to store files using WFS, internally inside MongoDB we are going to store them using two collections. By default it's going to be prefixed by FS, you can change that. And basically we're going to have what we call files and channels. Files basically is going to be something like this. It's a kind of metadata for the file. So as you can see here, you can find, uh, well, underscore ID has every object, uh, every document in MongoDB. We are going to, to have a string called file name that is totally arbitrary one. Uh, content type, length, this is the total length of the file. We are going to have also chunk size, we are going to talk about that later. A block date, again, we have now a date type because we are using this instead of JSON. And some additional fields, if you want, you can add custom fields inside metadata object and MD5 to, to check the file against corruption or similar. At the same time, we are going to have another collection called channels. And basically, uh, in MongoDB, every document has a limitation. That means that the maximum size is 16 megs. That means you can, you can store the documents with any structure that you want, but the only constraint that you have is that the maximum size of that document at binary level should be less than 16 megs. 16 megs, by the way, is quite a lot. There is an example that you can store the Holy Bible in four megs. So that means in one single document you would be able to store using UTA-8 encoding strings four times the Holy Bible. So the idea to store big files or files bigger than 16 megs is, okay, we're going to split the file that you're going to store inside WFS in different pieces that we're going to call chunks. You can find the same name, I mean chunks, in sharding, and it's totally unrelated. It's just the same name. By the way, we are really bad at picking names. I already mentioned this, we're really bad at picking names. Uh, so we, this was another bad decision to use the same name. Sometimes when people get confused, say, says, okay, I'm using with the face, so you have chunks, and you need to use sharding, is that it? No. So it's just the same string, nothing else. So, okay, we're going to split the files in chunks. And basically we're going to define a chunk size that we saw it in the previous one. So you define the chunk size per file. So when you're going to store a file in real face, you're going to say, okay, please, for this file, use this chunk size. It's going to be a number that basically is the number of bytes of each chunk and the drivers are going to split that file and generate these documents. So for example, if you have a, let's say a 30 megs file, and you're using a chunk size of the maximum size, it's going to be 16 megs, you're going to have two chunks. The first one is going to contain the first 16 megs, and the second chunk is going to contain 14 megs. 14 megs. Is it clear? Questions? Before I continue? Okay, so what, what is really powerful about this approach is that at some point there is no <coughs> limitation about what's the maximum size of the file that we want to store. I mean, the only limitation, of course, is physical. I mean, hard to try. Store it. Another good thing about having these two different collections is that if you want to access to the file metadata and not the file content itself, there are, there are different collections. 
So you can basically have different concepts and, and you can scale better. Because if you need to access what's the size of that file, you need to access to the content itself. You just access to the metadata. So for example, in, in, in this case I'm using a file, well I, I define some information like file name, etc. And for example, I have two chunks. And inside each chunk we are going to have two important fields, three actually. Uh, file ID that basically is like, let's say, the link, the foreign key to the files collection. We are going to have them that basically is the number of chunks. This is zero based, so basically it's, this is the first chunk because it's number zero and the other one is the, the second chunk number one. And then we are going to have the data itself. This, this is the binary string using the, the, the new data type that I mentioned before. Okay, so what about this model in between? So the idea when I start to think, say, okay, this is a good conversion, so I have to finish it one week. Uh, I wanted to use Node.js. No personal reason, basically, I just want, okay, I'm going to try a JavaScript driver. Uh, and my idea was to, okay, I'm going to store videos inside MongoDB and I want to stream them directly from GridFS uh, to the browser. Uh, at the same time, I wanted to use full text search. So I say, okay, maybe I can store subtitles, I can store the captions, if I have the captions, and I can apply full text search over those, over those and also apply provide search capabilities using those captions. Okay, so we don't have a schema. Actually, what we say is that we have a dynamic schema, but you have to have in your mind a kind of a schema or at least the shape that your data is going to have. Uh, why? Because it's is going to define your query access pattern. Actually, using MongoDB, what does it stop you to restore all your documents in, in, in just one collection? Absolutely nothing. If you want, you can do it. It's a good idea. Probably no. Probably no because you're going to have different access patterns. Imagine that if you have profiles and you have, I don't know, series and you store them in the same collection, probably you want to provide some search capabilities for profiles or for series. And probably you're going to use indexes over those to speed up those queries. And if you're going to basically mix totally different unrelated things, probably those indexes are not going to be a good idea, you know? So basically, we have to need, we need to have a, basically a shape in our mind of our data. So I said, okay, I'm going, I'm going to be totally honest with you. The idea was to build this to a sort of like files. So basically, I am a big fan of, of TV shows. So I'm a big fan of Breaking Bad. In the old days, I'm a big fan of Friends. Uh, I'm a big fan of, uh, what else? Downtown Abbey. Downtown Abbey, good one. I want to start House of Cards. Game of Thrones. Game of Thrones, not a good one. I'm also reading the book. Okay, so the idea was, I'm going to use this tool, and I'm going to start all my TV shows there. Uh, when I talk uh, with other guys in the company, that idea was to present this MongoDB TV here in, in this bag. They told me, you know, probably it's not a good idea because maybe somebody can tweet about, okay, MongoDB is being used to stream illegal code or something similar. So please, guys, don't tweet about this. But the idea is that I, I waited for this, and this is why I made this video names, show, and episode. You should have said about the tweet to start with. Right now. Jesus. Okay, so basically, uh, to solve this, I'm going to use, okay, one show. Uh, for example, I'm going to use a, a nicer, uh, let's say a more legal example. So I'm going to use the videos for the online courses that we have. I don't know if you're aware, but you can take online courses for free. Basically, just going to, uh, I don't know, the vision of the university of MongoDB.com. You can take online courses about how to use MongoDB. Uh, right now, we have basically two main courses. One, we have M101 that is for developers. Basically, they are going to teach you how to write applications using MongoDB, how to model your data, etc. And there is another one 
Uh, it's called M102 is for TBS for, for TBS. I really like that one because it it really goes sorry. It really goes into the details about uh, how the things are remaining, how indexes are remaining, how the trees work, etc. And that really helps you to get an idea how it works. Okay, so basically I, I went to the guy that uh, runs Education program is based in New York. His name is Andrew. And I ask Andrew, Andrew, by the way, can you give me all the videos that you have for online course because I want to run a proof of concept? So I have those videos. I'm giving to a certain information. I'm going to have one document per show. In my case, in this example, again, this is legal content. I'm using M102 for the base course. So then I'm going to have a few whole episodes. Now it's going to be an array. And in this array, I'm going to store, to, to store uh, objects for every episode. For every uh, episode I'm going to start season number and video. The video is going to be the file name that I'm going to use when I'm saving that file into read this. Then I wanted to start subtitles. Okay, for subtitles I said I'm going to use one document for every caption that happens in that episode. So basically for every caption, I'm going to start a start and end, basically it's the number of milliseconds since the beginning of the, of the video of that episode. Uh, I have a plain text, so I'm going to use full text search capabilities over that text field. By the way, to, to, to use full text search capabilities, the only thing that you need to do, apart from the memory, because it's not the memory by default, is just create a special type of index. You don't need to do nothing else. And then my idea was, okay, in case that somebody search for a specific caption, I'm going to use the start field, and I'm going to sit directly into that point of the video. Okay, let's see how it works. Again, remember that that's the maximum size per document. So if you want to upload a file bigger than 16 megs, it's going to be split into chunks. So let's say you have 4 gigabytes per file. Yeah, it's going to be split exactly per chance. Okay, so this is the interface. I'm using just Bootstrap on Twitter. And basically, the idea was okay, you're going to upload videos. So basically, you're going to have a list of shows. So, for example, I have M101P, again, legal content. Uh, and basically, you are going to specify a video file. And uh, SMT file, so basically, is, is a format to stop subtitles. And then you're going to specify which season and which episode. So, for example, I'm going to just I'm going to have two videos from the first week. So I'm going to upload more SRT. I'm going to specify first week. To show upload. So this is going to, up, to upload the video to ReadFS. It's going to generate all this metadata. It's going to split the SRT files. So basically, it has all the captions. So it's a topic. It's going to split all those SRT files and it's going to generate all those documents for the entire SRT file. So if I want... Welcome to M101 Mondo DB for developers. Okay, 
So this is being a stream directly from Rear Fest. This is into the first day of class. This is into the, the browser. I'm using video.js is an HTML5 video player. Um, so basically what I'm doing here, I will show you a good example later. Basically, I'm using ReadFS stream that is a JavaScript, Node.js JavaScript library to interact with ReadFS. And basically what ReadFS stream is going to return you in a callback is the stream directly from the ReadFS database. So here what I'm doing, I'm going to stream that stream, sorry, I'm going basically to pipe that stream into the HTTP response object. I know JS. Okay, by Express, I'm using Express. We can show it later. So let me make up a bigger database and very populated. So I wrote a small script that basically uploads all the videos from the inside course. I'm going to stop the database server. Make up another thing that I need. It's going to tell you a nice number that is a kind of average latency and so on. So in this really silly benchmark, with cold information, I mean with not being cached at any point, you can see that, well, no, you cannot see because there's number of stars as well, but it's between three and four times slower using WFS than serving the videos directly from file systems. That makes sense because there are more things involved in the middle. And uh, file systems nowadays are really optimized, you know. Uh, file systems are much older than real How about That's a good one. In MongoDB you can use sharding if you want. So that means that in sharding, if you, if you share the idea of sharding is you're going to split, you're going to partition your collection, and you're going to distribute those pieces into different servers. So that means that you're going to store your files, the same file, imagine, depending how do you shard, depending on your shard key, you're going to store your file, the same file, into different servers. So imagine that two pieces of that file are going to be in this server, and other two pieces are going to be in that server. So in case, maybe, you can get some in, in performance improvements against this. But again, it's going to be slower. Because if you use sharding, you need to use a router process that basically is going to be like the orchestrator across your different shards. So basically, basically it's going to retrieve from every shards that it needs to wait. And we are waiting for Mipo. You know, Mipo is slower than local file system. At least for now. But yeah, it's, it's uh, I mean, real process is a really it's not that I don't like WFS, I actually I really like the idea of WFS, but it's, it's, it's a special history for some particular stuff. So for example, if you want to, you can use, for example, imagine that you have replica sets. Replica sets basically is like copy of your primary in, in different servers. In yeah. This is for failover mostly, high availability. But one cool thing that you can do is, for example, if you are using, I don't know, you are using EWS, you can set up your replica set in different regions. So for example, you can have your primary in, in Singapore, data center, and you can have your secondary, one of your secondaries in East Coast in US and the other one in West Coast US. So that means, sorry, it doesn't matter. Uh, that means that uh, if you have clients worldwide accessing to that database, so if somebody is accessing from US, you can route that request, I mean, it's going to be transparent because you can specify uh, the read preference in MongoDB and you can specify nearest. That basically is going to pick, when it's going to read from MongoDB, it's going to pick the server with the lower latency. So you can specify nearest, so on your code side it's totally transparent, you don't have to change anything. And you're going to access to that file from the closest location. And you implemented that with almost no way. Setting up a replica set is something that you can do in five minutes, literally, five minutes. And again, on, on, on your application code, you don't have to change anything. Just specify with preference nearest. That's done. 
So on that side, William Pace is an amazing tool to basically try to build a distributed file system. Uh, but it's going to easily provide you a way to find the closest location for that file. A kind of CDA if you want for your database. So that's, that is something really cool. If you want to implement that using file system, it's going to be much harder. Or you want to pay a really big amount of money with the CDA. Agama is going to be really happy with that. Any question? So, yeah. Um, in the current scenario, are you suggesting that it's better to use a Depends. Depends. Like, uh, again, maybe you're going to say, okay, this guy only says depends. <laughs> but again, depends. For example, if you, if you have geographically distributed requirements, that is, is quite convenient. If you need to follow a disaster recovery, approach, like for example, every time you save a file, you have to be sure that that file is at the same time saving a location in a different continent just for disaster recovery. Again, using the place and replica set, that is just five minutes of configuration. So for those scenarios, it's we said probably it's a really good idea. You know what I mean? Because basically it's going to split, uh, not split, because we have a shot. Uh, this is going basically to copy, to replicate that file into your replica set nodes and then you can configure where those replica set nodes are, are, are based. More questions? Uh, hi. Yes. Is it like, uh, is it possible when you upload a file that it was uh, direct to type the truck? Then maybe it depends on the uh, uh, speed of the loading. It will switch from the uh, big truck to the smaller. I'm not familiar. I uh, mean, uh, like when <coughs> when you're streaming the video, yeah. suddenly the speed is uh, decreased and becomes lower. Is it possible for the size is uh, uh, switching to the uh, smaller size? Once you split the, the, the file into chunks, that cannot be changed. That is speeds. You specify when you uploaded the file to VFS. You specify, for example, a uh, chunk size of 8, 8 megs. That means that all the chunks are going to have 8 megs, except for the last one. Maybe the last one. Just is, you know, has this multiple of you know, uh, But And you cannot change that. You know, the file is split. It's totally split. And, and, and imagine that this kind of be buried into the same file, because otherwise, WFS wouldn't have a way to properly because if you need to see, imagine that you have an 8 meg chunk size and you need to see to the 20th meg, you know that you have to access chunk number 3 because basically it's the result of dividing the number of the megabyte that you want to access Magento. Uh, no. Are you going to use Magento again? Uh, no. 
Okay, so Magento is one of the one of the very popular uh, open source framework. According to their website, is the most flexible enterprise class e-commerce platform to power your business. And Magento is quite popular actually, not because of uh, well, 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 because it's bought by eBay, it's not eBay company, but also because it popularized the use of this uh, this pattern in storing uh, storing, docking, uh, storing data into EAD, the Entity Attribute Value Model. So it basically is a sparse matrix. According to their website as well, it's uh, for purposes of flexibility. Uh, they, one of their mantras is that flexibility, the cost of flexibility is complexity. And as you can see, this is actually part of their, uh, they actually <laughs> Get this as a download. That is going to be one of your. This is how your schema is going to look like for your sales code, for example, and then uh, it, it explodes. But why am I talking about this? Well, let's. Oh, actually, uh, one of the reasons why Magento developers are so in demand is because it's really very difficult to wrap your head around this. When you look at the ERD of a Magento database, you don't really know what. <coughs> what the connections are, because you can't reason it from it looking at it. You have to actually look at, even even the SQL query itself, the joins, the multiple joins uh, that it creates, you can't really reason about it. That's why Magento developers are very in demand. So if you want really uh, okay, be a Magento developer. <laughs> but why am I talking about this? So let's talk about what the problem that EAD or Magento tried to solve. And this is uh, one of my uh, favorite examples. Uh, imagine you were Amazon starting back then in the 1990s. You were only selling books online. And so you have a book model. So it's, it's very easy. You have a book. You have a scale, title, author, description, publication date. You're created at and your price in cents. And you store all of the product attributes in a table of books. And you don't get any further than that, at least for an MVP. You don't have any discuss of those things. So it's very straightforward. All you're selling is books, and everything's great in the relational world. And the question, but why, why do you use cents rather than dollars? Because dividing and floating point gives really bad results. I mean, you lose money on those. Thank you. Yeah. Actually, by the way, this is one of the features that sometimes you feel asked to have more with you. To support a kind of big decimal or something similar, basically round say decimal. Right. right now we don't have. Yeah. Yeah, and, uh, and, and there are some reasons sometimes happens that, uh, especially big companies, if you use cents, you cannot use cents because they manage so big numbers that you run out of them. Yeah, you using cents. So, but yeah, it's at least for, for because we run an e-commerce company as well here at Mind Valley, and we notice those floating point roundings, so we always save our prices in cents. We've never had a 30,000 US dollar product before, so we haven't overflowed yet. Hmm. Maybe we'll just switch to 64 and get into this next time. Or, so also well, well in the world, but thank you. That's that's actually an interesting. But it's good that you notice those things. You're actually paying attention to the slides. So all well in the world until your CEO says let's also sell magazines because they're like books. I mean, it's, it makes business sense. You sell books. That might as well sell magazines. So as a developer now, you have a problem because books are not. I mean, magazines are not books. They have extra data. So what you can do is you probably create a new table saying. It's some kind of a book, it also has a title, maybe an author or an editor, tomato, tomato, and a volume number and an issue number, maybe. So this this type of pattern is called an SDI. What's an SDI? It's actually, no, it's a single table inheritance. You, it's, it's, a, it's an object-oriented principle, it's an SI relationship, a magazine. Not really a book, but the way we model it in the database, it's a book. With a book ID, with a book metadata, and then you get the data that is book like, and just like magazine, you have a volume number, issue number. 
And again, also, well, until you, you hear those famous words, hey, I have a great idea. And then everything. Sorry? It's time to pivot. Yeah, it's, it's time to pivot. Hey, I have a great idea. That's, that's the, that's the, usually the, the this phrase that kills lots of startups. Yeah, I have a great idea. Let's also sell CDs. I don't know why, but let's sell CDs as the CD grows. So now you have, uh, you have a bit of conundrum here. Book, a, a CD is not exactly like a book. It's not exactly like a magazine. It does have some metadata common to it, like maybe a description or the, uh, the title, but not really. So you can have something like multi-table inheritance. So you have your product. So you split out the whole product, everything that's common to a product. You have your description, as SPA, creating and presence, publication date, or maybe a release date. CD, and then you have your books and magazines, the same thing. And then you have CDs, which are, which has the extra artist uh, metadata. So now you're you're starting to get the feel of uh, how how complicated it is. That now you have lots of different categories, and you have to keep track of it. And you still want it relational. You want to connect it to a single products. And then the CEO throws a curveball. Hey, I have a great idea. Let's also sell shoes. Which, by the way, uh, Amazon did. They, they of course, that was in India selling shoes. And so, you're, you're mind blown. You're going, no, no more. Your, your, your uh, relation skills uh, uh, cannot cope with that. I mean, the, the, the table, those things, there's just a lot of categories. And you're expecting. Uh, you're expecting a lot more product categories to come in the pipeline. If we've already sold shoes, we probably sell bags, and we probably sell sports equipment, and we sell beanbags, and all that. Cameras, electronics. And that is actually how EAD came about. Uh, when, when your data has, or you have a lot of entities that have a number of attributes, and to, to describe it, so you have an entity, you link it to, uh, actually this, this should be uh, this should be hints because they're actually foreign keys. And then you have, you have your attribute and you have your, your value. If you go back to the, to the screenshot of the Magento sample, you'll have these. So you have an entity type, attribute ID, entity ID, and then your value. And then this, these are texts, and these are bar cards, item, uh, ints, and these are decimals. So to describe a single sales code, you have all of these things. So it works, actually. It's mathematically proven to be working. The mathematical term for that is a sparse matrix. But it's not exactly human readable. Let's just stick to okay. that. Where's the map? Yeah, there you go. I like this picture of the what is this? Chipmunk? a hard time searching for it. And that is actually how EAD came about, is to solve this particular class of problems, product catalogs that have multiple categories. And so there are other approaches that you can do. Uh, store in the field, uh, store in the field data as a block. So you just send it as a JSON object maybe, or like a uh, common uh, delimited text inside a text field in the database, which is okay. I mean, sometimes it works if you're just storing data, but it's going to be inefficient because it's not indexable, and then you have, you're probably repeating a document database without really having the benefits of indexes, of theory, if everything is inside this field, you can't exactly say that I want all of the items that are less than $10, for example. You can do queries on uh, a field of text data. Maybe you can do text search, but you can have generic fields, you'll have attribute 001 to whatever, and then it just you'll have nails on the others or nulls. And that might also work, but then it's not very maintainable, it's error prone. You can't really have foreign keys to other other related data. You're just basically using it as a big Excel sheet in your database. So it defeats the purpose of using a relational database, you can't enforce constraints. This attribute Zero one might be all the text, but it could, it, your, for example, if it's a, if it's a integer, you can't really say that it has to be greater than or less than this particular number. Or you can create a new table for each product category. 
which is still also okay, but the more categories you have, the more tables that you have, and if you're stop selling this particular category, you have to do a lot of database operations. You have to create a table, you have to create the fields for this table, and all of those uh, maintenance tasks. And that's how MongoDB helps, because, or actually a document database uh, helps, which MongoDB is. And I will do some uh, demonstration for you on the command line. Is that right? Yes. Hmm. Okay. Yes. Are you, do you want to just skip to the next? No? Okay. Yeah. All right. By the way, I, I also use RoboMongo because the Mongo, the Mango thing. It looks nice. Yeah, it looks nice. I used to use the no Mongo, I forgot. I already forgot it like a few uh, months ago. It, it's not updated anymore, so I switched to Mongo. Uh, all right, let's have... Uh, I'm handling your data set. You used to have problems. You used to crash quite a lot, didn't you? Because of your data set size. Uh, We'll talk about that more next time. <laughs> All right. All right. So, the, so I'm a lead developer. I use Rails, so I'm going to be using uh, Rails. I'm going to show. I'm going to show you some Rails code. We have app models. And we have product. So if I'm going to de define a product, it's going to look like this. This, uh, this is the product. This is the, the, the common stuff that all my products have. Uh, the description, and the price and sense, and probably the scheme. And then my book definition will be looking like this. So as you can see, it's uh, very similar to uh, single table inheritance. It's all inheriting from product. You have your title and your author, and then you have your... The, the screen on the other side, you can see it right now. Oh. It's a little bit There? Yeah. That's good. All right. You can see it. All right. And you have your magazine, title, volume number, issue number. You have your CD, title and artist, and you have your shoe. Size, color, variant, description. They're all, they're all uh, inheriting from the product. Uh, Mm. product class and it, what's very good about MongoDB is actually it maps very neatly into how you would program in object-oriented uh, languages. So for example, I will show you the seeds file. Let's uh, turn the right on. And let's see. Alright, so when I create the book, Create SQ title description. As you can see, this is not really, uh, there's no uh, SQL, there's no insert into any of those things. It's all very easily done by the ODM or object database mapper and your shoe. And so, how does this look like in the database? So, here is a sample. You can see on this side. You'll see that this is your book. You have your ID type, SKU, again, type. The, the underscore type denotes the single table inheritance because whenever you query the products collection, you specify always the type and then it pushes it into that particular object. And then now you can see that the magazine is also different, the schema is different, the CD the schema is different, and for the for the shoe, it's completely different. You only have your SKU and you're created that data that the same. And everything else is like your size, color, variant description is also very different. So, and if you're going to probably model this in a in a relational database, you're probably going to look something like this, where you have lots of nails 
on the objects that doesn't have that particular uh, that particular feel. Everything good so far? Yeah. So the because it's a schema less, it doesn't really care or schema free. It doesn't really care what kind of data you put in there, and it's up to you to make sense of that particular data. All right. So that's how you get to to how do you call this? You get to manage the complexity of multiple product categories into your database. You don't need to use EAD, you don't need to use log, you don't need to create a new table for each category, you just put them all into your products collection and then use your object mapper to map your entities into your uh, application. So if for example you need to query some data So for example, I want to see all CDs where the artist is Coldplay, then you just do C CD where artist is Coldplay, and then it is to do an array, and then it will spit out that particular entity that has data. And if I just want, mm. for example, all products, then it will spit out all of the products. So you can have category level. So far, yes. Hi. Sorry. Because we never define a category table. Yes. Can you actually know what are the unique artists that you have for the CD? That probably you probably use a MapReduce or an aggregation layer. So you do. It's a bit complicated, but you will do. You will do a map of all of all uh, entities that have that particular artist. Or all artists, and then you create a document, and then on your reduce you fill account, and then you find out unique. Uh, so it's very, very complicated to do. It's a different way of thinking. If you're used to SQL, I mean, you do a distinct query, it's already very complicated. Map reduce is a different way of thinking. If you're used to functional languages, then actually uh, map reduce comes very easy. If you've done Haskell or Erlang, it's, uh, it makes sense, but it's a different way of thinking. But yes, it's possible to do something like a distinct query in MongoDB. Did I answer your question? Yeah. I think so. Okay. <coughs> Any questions so far until before I go ahead? All right, so that is uh, the primary advantage of, uh, of MongoDB or a document database in, uh, in this case. The concept is similar to single table inheritance. Because it's schema free, you don't need to do an alter table, for example. You just push whatever kind of uh, fields that you have, and then MongoDB will accept it. A document is a document. One of the, what you, if you've probably heard me do a lot of talks here, because Mark is lazy to find speakers, so I've been speaking about a lot of our experiences here at Mind Valley, where we were thinking in relational terms, because we've been doing post a lot and SQL a lot, so we were trying to make MongoDB behave as a SQL database or a relational database, and it didn't work out. And it's not MongoDB's fault, we just didn't know how to use it. And the more experience we had with document databases, the more we know that, hey, this approach wasn't the correct approach. So you have to think differently. And other advantages are the quote from the MongoDB blog. blog. You can prototype faster, like what uh, Mark was saying because you don't really need to alter tables or create tables, MongoDB will do that for you. You can query on custom fields. You don't need to, uh, it will be faster with an index, but you don't need to create the column first and then make it, uh, and then, uh, so that you can, you can have that particular field. You just create that particular field. And there's no relational complexity because a document can have embedded uh, documents within itself, and then when you retrieve a document, you retrieve everything, it's like a free join for that particular document. Alright, so that's it for my presentation. It's a short one, because Mark didn't do his part. <laughs>
Yeah, that's my fault, guys. I was supposed to pick up from that. Um, but any questions on on yeah. e-commerce? Yeah. How would you handle your stock, the number of products that you have, and things like that? This is a loaded question. It's not. I don't know what you're talking about. Please tell me. Where would so you what, keep Where would you keep that kind of information? I mean, uh, the recommendation here is that just so that you can sidestep a lot of the currency problems you will encounter because of another topic entirely. You usually have each stock map to your own product. For example, if you have 10 uh, T-shirts, you'll have 10 documents for that. Because MongoDB is atomic on the document level, so you can have a switch saying uh, sold or not, and then uh, it's just it, it just makes it easier. You don't have to do concurrency mutation and blocks and double blocks and double base commits and those things. You sidestep all of those problems. That's how. That's so don't keep accounts. So like you don't, you don't, so you you don't keep one product for a hat and then put stock quantity. Yeah, five. you don't you don't put stock quantities in those things because you're mutating. mutating. It's the same as programming in multi-threaded programs. You have to keep a lock on those things. Make sure that data uh, like process don't access the same thing and then they retrieve different values. So you just mm -hmm. create documents for each stock. <coughs> Well, it's not that magical. Have is a strong word. This is kind of one of the points of I think using NoSQL solutions. It's it's so different to what we're used to. In SQL terms, there's usually only one correct way of doing things. In most cases, most things have one way that it works, and you're used to doing it in that same way every single time. It becomes natural. With MongoDB and NoSQL solutions, you're often making choices and they Choices, the decisions change based on the scale and, and the, the use cases, and, which is why people keep saying it depends, it depends, it depends. Okay. Wow, that's, yes. And for me, that's one of the exciting things. Finally, I have choice. Finally, I, I can start making decisions and, and do things. It's, I don't know, it's interesting. Suddenly, it, it's caused me to be interested in databases again because things, things change. You, you have choices. My example, I was, I, was, I was supposed to take over the presentation and talk about um, Transactions specifically, because MongoDB has a bad reputation for you know because it's a lack of acid compliance. It, this is something that the, the haters bring up quite often. So SQL comes with acid transactions, MongoDB doesn't. So why would I ever use it for commerce or transactions? Well, as Tristan was saying, it kind of does have autonomy as long as it's within a single document. You lose that when you're trying to create the relationship. So the, the project I was working on recently was with transactions. I, I had that SQL thinking where I'm obviously I'm saving my transactions, but at the same time I was keeping account balances. You know, you, you have a balance of what credits are left in that account and what they're using. Because this is a SQL way of doing things, and you spend the thing, and then you go back and you make the change. And it didn't, it wasn't a good idea for MongoDB. In the, in the end, I've now removed, I don't, I don't keep a balance. I'm using a more an event-driven architecture where every single time I buy or spend something, it goes in as a document. If I want to find out what the balance is, I'm doing an aggregation of that. I'm going over the, so there's by doing that, I've removed the need for trying to update two or three places. It, it, it so it depends. It, it's pros and cons. And when you have like if you you had 20,000, 100,000 hats, and that's a bad situation where you want to do it. So it depends. But, and uh, you've not used MongoDB for e commerce or transactions? Or? We don't support transactions. <laughs> <laughs> so the other way with transactions is obviously doing your code. Which no, is sometimes you, you got. Sometimes you got to think your schema in a different way. That will be transactional, you know, because as he mentioned, at document level, everything is transactional. So if you update that document and you are updating several fields, and imagine that you have an array inside the document that you are in new elements, etc., it cannot happen that two concurrent threads can see that document half updated or something similar. So a single document is transactional. Uh, so that means sometimes you can think you're scheming a different way. Um, 
and that, that will be transactional in, in this new approach. Uh, another typical example about the, the typical bank example of reacting money from one account and putting on the other account. Okay. That typical example, actually, it's, it's not even like that in real life. You know, in, in real life, they use external systems to to keep that process transactional. Because imagine if you are working in this transaction example with different banks. Come on, they are not running in the same database. You know, so don't talk about transactions. <laughs> Basically, it's implemented using well, external orchestrator and they use operations that are called idempotence. Idempotent operations means that in case of an error, or let's say if you are not sure if one operation was really executed or not, you can repeat it several times and won't go in a, to affect the final result. So this is actually Real transactions are being implemented. So yeah, sometimes that. Uh, having said that, it's clear that MongoDB is not the best solution for every scenario. If your information is 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 table, is terminal data, and you want to run uh, aggregation functions over that, come on, just use relational database. This is going to be better. You know, is not a silver bullet. It, it's it works really well on some common use cases. For example, when you talk about the inheritance and giving the dynamic schema. Uh, I had a question before we start. It says, okay, in which really, uh, what are really good scenarios for MongoDB? There are several. Uh, if you want to use analytics, MongoDB is a really good example to, to run analytics. Remember that the company was founded by a guy called uh, Dwight Merriman and Elliot Horowitz. These guys were the, the founders of uh, DoubleClick. DoubleClick basically was an advertising company that was sold to Google a couple of years ago. They pay $1.5 billion for that. And basically, this is the company that after that became Google Ads. Uh, so when they started, to work on, on, on their new startup, I mean, Dwight Merriman and Alien Horowitz, the initial idea when they created 10J was to build a kind of cloud platform quite similar to, for example, Google App Engine. So the idea was to create a kind of cloud platform. And after running this first company inception, they figured out that the, the stack wasn't really good in general, I mean, the, the entire cloud platform. But the database was really good. So this is why they decided to spin off and just focus on the database and they created MongoDB. But when, well, why I made this introduction? Because when they created this stack, they were thinking in the problem that they face in DoubleClick. Um, basically, again, it was kind of Google Ads. So everything is about counting impressions, counting visits, counting things. So for those scenarios, Mongo works really, really well. And we are talking that can handle perfectly really high throughput. We are talking really big numbers. A good example is, is MMS. MMS, maybe you heard about it, maybe you don't. It's, it's, a, it's a web front end to monitor your Mongo database. So you can monitor everything there, everything is sent, running, etc. And it's, it's, it's free, you can use it. It's, it's, you just need to install in your database an agent that is a small program that basically is going to send uh, more the information to this database and it's going to be aggregated. Uh, and more, MMS is implemented using uh, MongoDB, of course. This is like Joel Spolsky says, you have to eat your own dog food. Uh, so again, we are tracking literally right now millions of servers and every server is sending a ping. If I don't remember, probably something like once per minute. So I think that our current numbers in this is that we are approximately writing 4 billion of operations per day. Sure. So every time, for example, a database server sends, okay, how many queries is being executed, how many uh, number of available memory, resident memory, virtual memory, all those. Yeah, metrics that are being tracked in MMS, RSR, and MMS, So it's a good example. 
what else? Uh, dynamic schema, analytics, uh, all kind of logging, etc. It's really well because we are dynamic and it's flexible. Uh, when you're looking for horizontal scalability, horizontal scalability means you need more power, you have more servers. Uh, basically, that progression is quite linear. So, double up servers, number of power. So, on that side, it's, it's really good. We have good success stories on that. Uh, what else? Uh, what's coming? Uh, as Mark mentioned, uh, like a bit more than one month ago, we raised. Uh, I mean, they raised. I uh, didn't do anything. <laughs> they raised 150 million in a new uh, fund round. Basically, big companies like uh, IBM, Salesforce, uh, Sequoia, etc. Uh, right now, MongoDB is by far the most well-founded uh, storage engine right now ever. Uh, as you mentioned, the company now is, is the value of the company is 1.2 billion. Uh, so the idea of, of those 150 million is to invest a lot in improve the product. So we have that there are some things that we are not good at. So for example, if you have big charting, it's uh, if you want to manage and administer those really big chart, big chart clusters, you need to put pretty much effort. So the idea is try to build tools to make those process an automatic way. Uh, improve all the monitoring tools. Uh, maybe in the future have an official uh, ID to interact with the database. Um, what else? We need to invest a lot also supporting customers. Uh, actually, the people is really happy with our support. Uh, I'm talking about paying customers because you can use MongoDB for free, but if you want, you can pay. We have three different subscription models, etc. So if you pay, you get paid support, and you get 24 by 7. And, uh, the people is really happy with that support, but we need more people. Sure, but the pricing tiers here in Asia for that support. The pricing tiers in Asia Asian prices, or are they all fixed international? No, it's worldwide. You always pay the same. No, no small, <coughs> no small phone, no small letter. I think this, the cheapest one is you pay five thousand. I think it was two hundred five five thousand. No, I think it was two two thousand five hundred. Uh, that is the amount you pay per server per year. Uh, this includes. Support uh, training and consultancy. There is a, a specified amount of hours that you get per year per server for that support. Uh, the most expensive one, uh, I think, is seven seven thousand five hundred per year. In that case, you get access to uh, a different version of the, of the MongoDB server itself. That basically is like the open source version, but with some add-ons. That probably makes sense in, in really big enterprise environments like setup authentication, Kerberos, auditing, etc. So probably big companies that want to have those features are going to pay for that. Uh, as I said, the, the support that we have, the people is really happy with that. Uh, we have SLAs, uh, but our average response time it doesn't matter how much are you paying and in which subscription are you using. I think it's less, the average is less than 10 minutes. Uh, we have a follow the sun support, so basically support starts in Australia office. Uh, then after Australia is jumping to Dublin in Ireland, the idea in the future is to build a support office in, in, in Israel. So we are going to have one point in the middle. Then it's going to East Coast in US, it's going to New York. Uh, my last is going to West Coast, California, Palo Alto. And then again Australia. So it's 24 by 7. Um, yeah, but we need to to have more people, especially here in Asia, you know. Uh, hiring in Asia as well, no? <laughs> the idea is to hire in Asia, of course. So please, if somebody is interested in joining us, we are more than welcome. Just go to mongoby.com slash jobs or careers. Uh, there are a lot of openings right now. If you think that you can match, if you think that you are a good fit for that position, please. 
We need more people. Believe me, my wife thinks so because I'm traveling too much. So we, we, we need more people. Probably if, if you ask her, she's going to say yes. Um, what else? Yeah, that's pretty much what I have to say. If somebody has any questions about what we talk about the company, about future plans. Yeah, I mean, also, does anyone have the first timers and those that aren't using the number of Team Queen yet? Are there any questions that might be related to anything we think? Obviously, some of the topics we covered today were, were maybe advanced topics. If anyone has any just any questions of any kind about MongoDB, how it works, why you should be using that instead of MySQL, now would be the best time or forever hold your peace. Or we go over the bar and, and chat there. Mm -hmm. Not last question. Hi, um, I'm actually working on some um, financial products and uh, we actually need to track all the changes made to the document. So uh, even like uh, for what uh, for our spec uh particular record, uh, if we add or remove an object from 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 a uh, uh, array or something, we need to find out what what was being changed and uh, what changed. So is there any uh, suggested way to uh, to that? Of course, uh, we can do it in our our, our own way, but is, is there is there any native way or something? So you want to have like a kind of versioning? Okay, version you know, document the files. Not, not really in a document level, but in a record level. In a record level. Right now, there is no way of, of applying some versioning, so probably you will have to write something on the application level. You know? There is nothing. Uh, the good thing about, since, for example, you can have a race as a field, probably it's a good idea that inside a document you can have a race with all the different versions. It's a race going to keep the order you want to assume, okay, the first one is the oldest one and then it's increasing the rest of it. But yeah, but if you are looking for somebody for something out of the box, no. So there is nothing. Okay, thank you. Good question. Uh, and another good thing before I forget that is again we have really good online courses. So free, free, free online. Free, sorry, free, that's really important. Free online courses. Believe me, they are really, really good. With certificates, you know? With certificates, it's something that is going to say that you... Basically, the, the course is a seven weeks course. Uh, you need to invest time, approximately between four or five hours per week. Um, there is a final exam, I did in one or two. There is a final exam. Uh, basically, part of your final score is going to be 50% based on your performance across your weekly assignments and 50% of the final exam. And again, it's really, really good. Uh, I would strongly advise somebody in this working with MongoDB to go through those courses. In case you want to take the one uh, for programming and using MongoDB, it's called M101. We have right now three editions. We have M101 J for Java, M101B for Python, and M101 uh, GS. It's for no GS. I don't know. <laughs> Which data do we, did we pick? Uh, but believe me, they're really good. So I would strongly advise if somebody's interested in working with MongoDB, just sign up. It's totally free. If you are doing well, you are, get, uh, you are going to get a nice certificate that says you complete. Uh, and if you did really well, I heard that they are starting to contact the guys who successfully complete the, the course. So it's, it's a good uh, entry point if you're interested in working. Uh, with MongoDB. So, yeah, this is a really good one. So thanks for coming down. I mean, you had a, you had a big data conference, right? Today and tomorrow. Right now, uh, I came here to talk in, in this session also to attend Big Data Work uh, Conference that uh, right now is being today and tomorrow in Marriott Hotel. If somebody is interested in attend, uh, I think we have a couple of seats remaining, and when I say a couple, maybe I'm talking about just a few, maybe two or three. Uh, I don't know how much does it cost the ticket, but I heard it's expensive. So we so I free in attending tomorrow's session. Uh, just let me know, and we can find a way. Probably, if we don't run out of tickets. One thing, uh, if you see me tomorrow, probably you're going to see, that's not the guy I met yesterday, because probably I'm going to wear a shirt. Whatever, but this is the real me. Uh, the other 
one that I always use tomorrow is just for me. Uh, I'm not going to lie to you, it's going to be a lot of managers and all those kind of people. But apart from that, you can use good things. Good food? Good food, it's okay. Yeah. So, if somebody wants to join me tomorrow, uh, I'm going to see a couple of tickets, just let me know. We're going for a quiz, so probably you can let me know there. Uh, I think there is a tracing code. You know, just. No flip flops. Yeah, just don't wear a soccer t shirt, you know, something like that. Okay. Uh, what else? Uh, what's going on in Asia? We are going a lot in Asia. By the end of the year, uh, there are two big Mongo TV days. Mongo TV days is a one day conference that we organize with several tracks in parallel with a lot of topics since the schema design. Uh, Technical implementation, low level, really cool stuff. Uh, you are going to see uh, they are free. It's on December 10th in Korea, Seoul, in, on December 12th in Tokyo. Somebody is in the name just no Singapore. Still no Singapore. We should organize something in Singapore, probably not by this year. We are running out of the of time this year. Uh, we have really big customers here in Asia. For example, uh, do you know eSports? The backend that is running is kind of FIFA, so we're playing it. It's using MongoDB. Mm. There are other big companies that there is MongoDB, and for some reason they don't want to talk about that. Actually, our team for this, we're not going to talk that there is MongoDB. This is our team in our company.